Thank you, Jack. It's a real honor to be here today to be a part of this esteemed award and in the presence of those finalists here. Just reading the names of past recipients and finalists of the Townsend Prize comprises a huge corner of Southern literature. It's also a real honor to once again get to bask in the energy and spirit of Mr. Terry Kay because uh, that is storytelling at its finest. And I'm often asked, what, you know, what, what is it about the South that just continues to generate nonstop these stories and novels in a way that sets this body of literature off on its own planet, and deservedly so. And my first answer is always that fine art of storytelling and what it brings in. I'm often referred to as a Southern writer, a woman writer, a Southern woman writer, <laughs> all adjectives accepted. When I walk in and open my mouth, that's exactly who I am. My native home and my gender have indeed led me to be the person and the writer I am. The artist Edward Hopper said, the man is the work. Something doesn't come out of nothing. And when given credit for American scene painting and expressing the loneliness and stagnation of town life, he said, I don't think I ever tried to paint the American scene. I'm trying to paint myself. I think the same can be said for many writers. Now that I've lived in New England for over 10 years, I'm aware more than ever of which traits and details are purely Southern and which are open to a broader arena of people. The foliage that I miss is completely Southern. The magnolias, magnificent, I got here just in time. And each year at the holiday season, I'm astounded by what I have to pay for big waxy magnolia leaves and pine cones. Pimento cheese, grits, you can sometimes find instant. Country ham, calabash style seafood, goodies headache powders, strictly southern. Statues in the center of town to commemorate the Confederate dead, an obvious answer. Iced tea. My first winter in Boston, still not used to darkness at four in the afternoon. I ordered this beverage in a restaurant, only to be told that it was out of season. <laughs> I said, what, do you have to go shoot it? <laughs> I laughed, the waiter did not. Iced tea, Southern. Sense of humor, varies in all regions. Get on an elevator and say MASH 9 and see where that will get you. <laughs> Other than a host of people looking at you like you just stepped from a spaceship. <laughs> MASH, Mike could, all Southern. Southerners have a strong attachment to certain foods and foliage, an innate awareness of the war, even when you're liberal-minded and very happy about how it all turned out. This awareness is often set in place in early childhood when people make you attend C of C, that would be children of the Confederacy, <laughs> meetings, and you are enamored of Scarlett and her vow to never be hungry again. Southerners often have a certain brand of humor that people either get or don't. And of course, there's a great sense of nostalgia. This is part of what has kept the war going all these years. The writer Barry Hanna talks about how Southern children are nostalgic by the age of nine or 10, and it is absolutely true. They are already mourning losses, their own, their parents, the South at large. It's like that joke, how many Southerners does it take to change a light bulb? Three, and preferably more, one to change it, and at least two to talk about what a good old bulb it was. <laughs> And then there is that fine art of storytelling. I often tell people that I don't come from a long line of literary people, but I do come from a long line of creative ones. 
The difference is that their creations were either immediately devoured or worn until threadbare or simply given over to the air in the form of a story while sitting out on a porch or under a tree. The method, now a kind of stereotype, goes something like this. Let me tell you what happened to poor Emily Baker. There's the hook. But first now, I have to remind you about how Emily's daddy used to own the hardware store that was where the Winn-Dixie is now. (laughs) Remember his store burned all the way to the ground, took the fire trucks from two towns over to help what's called a a five alarm. The same summer, we were having a drought so awful that there was a ban on watering and all the azaleas looked terrible and nobody knew got asked into the garden club as a result. (laughs) Well, anyway, people always suspected he might could have burned the building down himself, what with the fact that he had not been right in the head since his wife, not Emily's mama, she died of cancer of the pancreas many years before. But the second wife met and ran off with the pharmaceutical salesman she met while visiting her sick Uncle Ben at the VA hospital over in Fayette. (laughs) Eventually, if you're patient, you'll probably learn that what happened to Emily was something like she got a flat tire out on the interstate (laughs) while heading to the outlet mall and had to call AAA to come help her. In her wonderful book, One Writer's Beginning, Eudora Welty talked about how as a child she learned early to listen for the story. And I knew exactly what this meant. Somewhere woven into the history and detail, the asides that often carry us far into left field, there is a plot line. Something actually happened. But there are other stories as well, slipping like bright threads in all directions, and you follow first this one and then that one. If you listen long enough, they begin to come clear. There is indeed a pattern and a texture. And then, in true Southern style, when they are repeated to you for the fourth or fifth time, you know them by heart. My grandmother never could have written the story she told. Her self-described chicken scratch was engaged only for grocery lists and recipes. The occasional letter I received in college with a dollar and a stick of juicy fruit gum tucked in (laughs) that said simply, Dear Jill, Please come home. (laughs) And yet her words, her stories, as well as those of other older relatives and my parents, painted a picture of our town for me that went back two generations, such that even now my vision of Lumberton, North Carolina, appears in my mind like a series of transparencies. The rural small farms, dusty tobacco fields, the dirt roads and horse and buggies of my grandmother's childhood, the downtown area and the way it looked when my parents were teenagers and walked to the movies and the local drugstore, places I frequented in my own childhood, even as I-95 was barreling through town and bringing with it motels and fast food. We were still allowed to stay out until the streetlights came on. We rode our bikes behind the mosquito truck, lost in clouds of poison. (laughs) Imagine how smart we all could have been. (laughs) We put pennies on the railroad tracks and waited for the train to come by and flatten them. But even within that nostalgic safety, there was grief and loss, a dying grandparent, Hometown boys killed in Vietnam, a brilliant Green Beret officer accused of murdering his young family at the Army base 15 miles away. My hometown, at every stage of progress, is firmly etched in my mind by the various stories told, and it serves as backdrop to my fictional world again and again. It's home. Interestingly, the first time I ever felt at home in Boston was when going to the Franklin Park Zoo. I found myself in Roxbury, surrounded by Baptist churches and collards being sold by the roadside. I felt myself relax completely, though I realized the people with me were anything but. Despite a lot of well-versed, absolutely necessary, liberal politics, I have also found Boston and that area to be one of the most segregated places I had ever been. 
And there, in my moment of absolute comfort, I was also in the middle of an African-American neighborhood. All I had noticed was that it looked like home, smelled like home, made me feel at home. And yes, my South has a history I wish it didn't. And I know that the theater in my town once had a sign that said colored and designated the balcony seats accordingly. It's a memory I wish I didn't have to have. But I also know that by the time I was in the sixth grade, our schools were integrated and it was not an unusual sight to find people of all shapes, sizes, and colors wherever I went. And this leads to the whole topic of the Southern stereotype, one I might add that is still an acceptable prejudice, perhaps the only remaining prejudice that people who consider themselves educated and politically correct still laugh about. I have had people assume from my accent, or when I say I grew up going to a Baptist church, that I might be racist, speak in tongues, have an IQ the same as my shoe size. <laughs> I'm told jokes about incest and hookworm. I often retaliate with the challenge that we just don't keep our grace pools hidden in the attic. We have a strong enough sense of self and honesty to bring them out into the sunlight and plant them in the front yard. Live and let live. I maintain that those unwilling to submit to such honesty and truth are also those who will never in their lives write or tell a good story. I once heard a highly intelligent person, a non-Southerner visiting the South, with me there listening, say that PBS in the South meant reruns of the Dukes of Hazard. It made me want to tell him to get his fat lard ass outside before I fetched my gun. <laughs> I wanted to slap his hand and ask, where are your manners? And manners, that's a big one. Once when my parents came to visit me, I noticed that my poor dad stood each and every time a woman or older gentleman got on the train. I was nine months pregnant at the time, and the only person who had ever offered me a seat was a woman so old we fought over who needed to sit down the most. <laughs> there is often the assumption that the South is nothing more than Bible Belt politics and those still waiting for news that the Confederacy lost the war. <laughs> and it's a ridiculous misconception as ridiculous as any other racist and belittling stereotype. And this is where I began to see the overlap of Southern culture with other groups. This is where I see our body of literature, as richly defined and devoured as any out there, joined thematically with others. The attention to food and drink, a brand of humor that speaks to hardship and pain, a language that is clearly heard and unique in its own right, and reams of memories and histories that are told again and again. Irish writers, Jewish, African American, I believe that any group of people who has ever been set aside or deprived by poverty or illiteracy or prejudice have an even greater need to preserve the past and tell their stories. They are historians, and they are entertainers. They have to find what is comic in the midst of tragic so as to keep moving forward, to laugh and keep breathing. It's survival. Mark Twain said that laughter is the human race's only really effective weapon, and George Bernard Shaw said that his way of joking was just to tell the truth. Lenny Bruce said people should be taught what is, not what should be. All of my humor is based on destruction and despair. Pain, sorrow, grief, isn't that what we really want to see in literature, the experience and a way of learning? Who wants to read a story where everything's perfect and nothing whatsoever happens? It would be like an endless pile of those holiday brag letters where no one tells of the year's misfortune and losses but only of brilliance and success and good times. And who wants to read that? Give me something that will break my heart. 
Make me ache. Make me laugh and weep simultaneously. Make me care and feel. That is what a story should do. And oftentimes a story is as much about all that has come before the situation at hand. There's history and nostalgia. There are regrets and losses. There are joys that in hindsight take on a different level of pain just because they're no longer there. Again, the nostalgia. Find a story that really works and you will find that dark tap root. The South will always exist as a big stack of transparencies, one laid on top of another as we grow and become even more different and diverse. Tracking the history from the war to a present day population as varied in beliefs and cultures as any other place, and yet securely bound by the climate and the landscape and the accent and the food and the camellias blooming in some southern yard even when I'm sitting with snow and ice outside my window and a vase full of magnolia leaves that cost the same as a nice dinner for two. There's a longing for home and there always will be. Even when I'm there, I'm still longing, always longing. And for me, that's what literature is all about. Thank you. that I will never, you know, in true, like I'll never be hungry again. I'll, I'll never have to buy my magnolia leaves again because, in fact, I am moving back to the South at the end of July. I'm happy to be So um, congratulations once again to the finalists, and thank you again for having me here. It's a real honor.